Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor Jim Pytel and today's topic of discussion is circular area and cylindrical volume. Our objective is to learn how to calculate circular area and cylindrical volume, critical properties which influence actuator strength and speed in fluid power systems. Additionally, we'll examine common unit conversions encountered hydraulics and pneumatics. This lecture operates under the presumption that viewers are passing familiarity with basic math, scientific calculators, and unit conversion. If you're a little rusty on these topics or lack confidence in these skills, by all means check out the prerequisite math lectures available at the Big Bad Tech channel and bring yourself up to speed. The principal linear actuator employed in both hydraulic and pneumatic systems, the cylinder, is as its name implies, cylindrical in shape. It is therefore worthy of our time to familiarize ourselves with the calculation of circular area and cylindrical volume as these properties, among others, influence actuator force and speed in fluid power systems. As you are no doubt aware, a circle is a shape with two sides, an inside and an outside. I never tire of that joke. More accurately, a circle can be defined using two properties. One, the radius, R, being a line that travels from the center to one edge, or two, the diameter, D, being a line that goes from edge to edge, passing through the center. Radius is half of diameter. Diameter is twice the radius. Makes sense, right? For the purposes of these initial exercises, we'll express radius and diameter using U.S. customary dimensions of inches. We'll explore metric calculations before we bring this lecture to a close. Circular surface area, expressed in units of square inches, is dependent upon radius and diameter. Circles with larger radii and larger diameters have larger surface areas, i.e. you can fit more equal sized squares inside a larger circle. Conversely, circles with smaller radii and smaller diameters have smaller surface areas, i.e. you can fit less equal sized squares inside a smaller circle. There exist two formulas commonly used to calculate circular surface area, one that employs radius and the other employing diameter. For technical purposes, my sincere advice is to forget radius and use only diameter for this simple reason. Hydraulic and pneumatic cylinders, when purchased from a fluid power equipment manufacturer, are ordinarily specified only in terms of diameter and not radius. The formula of choice suggests circular surface area is equal to pi over 4 times diameter squared. As simple as this formula may seem, a number of traps exist for those unaccustomed to the order of operations and proper use of the scientific calculator, not to mention engineering format and rounding. First, consider the ratio pi over 4. Pi in all its transcendental glory is available on the Texas Instruments TI-89 Titanium Edition Scientific Graphing Calculator, made in China, as second carat. Of note, this calculator is set up to display numbers using engineering format whereby a coefficient is multiplied by specific powers of 10. One can enter pi over 4 as second caret, divide by 4, and press enter. A scientific calculator using engineering format might return the value of 785.39, etc., E negative 3, which means 785.39, etc., times 10 raised to the negative 3, or 0.78539, etc., etc. For this reason, you're often going to see the circular surface area formula written as 0.784 times diameter squared, where 0.7854 is a reasonably accurate approximation of pi over 4 round to the ten thousandths place. For the purposes of this course, I'm recommending you don't use this approximation, since the calculator is authorized in this course, and it'd be foolish not to put this most powerful of tools to work to its full capacity. This being said, Think about the number 0.7854 as it relates to a circle with a diameter of 1 inch and compare it to the surface area of a square with a side length of 1 inch. A square with a side length of 1 inch has a surface area of 1 times 1 or 1 square inch, whereas a circle with a diameter of 1 has a surface area of roughly 0.7854 square inches. When you overlay the circle on the square, the difference is obvious. A circle with the same diameter as a square has less surface area than the square, approximately 21 percentage less, because the circle does not include the corners, whereas the square does. Let this be a quick check of your work. Circles always have maybe around 79 percent of the area of a square with similar dimensions. If your calculations suggest otherwise, you are doing it wrong and you need to do a hasty retreat and reassess your work. 
Let's try a couple of illustrated examples of this calculation. Consider circles with the following dimensions. Circle 1 with a diameter of 5 inches. Circle 2 with a diameter of 2.5 inches. Circle 3 with a radius, note the dramatic pronunciation, radius of 6 inches. And finally, circle 4, the top of a 55 gallon barrel with a diameter of 22.5 inches. Given this information, calculate surface area in units of square inches rounded to the tenths place for each circle. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. Substituting the diameter for circle 1 in the circular surface area equations suggests circle 1 has a surface area of roughly 19.6 square inches. Similarly, substituting the diameter for circle 2 into the circular surface area equation suggests circle 2 has a surface area of roughly 4.9 square inches. Before we move on to example 3, you note that circle 1 has twice the diameter of circle 2. As a result, circle 1 has four times the surface area of circle 2 because the area calculation squares diameter. One might make the general observation that surface area grows geometrically with linear increases in diameter. Double the diameter, area increases by 4, and so on. Moving on, circle 3 is specified using radius. Diameter is 2 times radius. A circle with a radius of 6 inches has a diameter of 12 inches. Substituting the diameter for circle 3 into the circular surface area equation suggests circle 3 has a surface area of roughly 113.1 square inches. Lastly, substituting the diameter for circle 4, the 55 gallon drum lid, into the circular surface area equation suggests the drum lid has a surface area of roughly 397.6 square inches. Make a note of these answers for this first set of illustrated examples because we use them later calculations. Alright, hopefully that wasn't too hard, was it? Let's examine some additional applications of circular surface area calculations. Consider this real world application. Oftentimes technicians are tasked with finding parts that meet desired specifications. For example, let's say we were being asked to find a hydraulic cylinder with a cap surface area of at least 250 square inches, of which the manufacturer offers the following dizzying array of diameter choices. 2.5 inches, 4 inches, 6, 8, 10, 12, 16, 20, 25, 32, 40, 50, and 63 inches. I suppose if you're hard-headed, you could walk down the catalog and manually calculate the surface area for all these diameter choices and stop when you find the right one, but ain't nobody got time for that. A far easier method would be to use a spreadsheet. Write a formula and copy it down the column and pick the right one. But let's say you don't have access to a computer. A far quicker and easier method necessitating no computer resources is to algebraically manipulate the circular surface area formula and solve for diameter in terms of area. If you're not skilled in algebraic manipulation, by all means check out the algebraic manipulation lecture available at the Big Bad Tech channel. Presuming you're skilled in this techniques, one will solve for diameter in terms of area by isolating unknown diameter on one side of the equation using the following steps. Multiply both sides by 4. 4 cancels out on the right. We're left with 4 area equals pi times diameter squared. Divide both sides by pi. Pi cancels out on the right. We're left with 4 area divided by pi equals diameter squared. Square root both sides. We're left with square root of 4 area divided by pi equals diameter. Note we're square rooting the entirety of 4 area divided by pi, not just the 4a on top. One can make this exceedingly obvious by enclosing 4 area divided by pi in parentheses. We're ultimately left with diameter equals the square root of 4 area over pi. Substituting the desired surface area, in this case 250 square inches, into the algebraic manipulation demonstrates a cylinder with a diameter of roughly 17.8 inches would do the trick. Problem is, the manufacturer doesn't offer a cylinder of this exact proportions. 16 inches is too small and 20 inches is too big. However, if you pay attention to the original specifications, we need a surface area of at least 250 square inches. 20 inch diameter device should be more than capable of meeting these needs. As a means of checking our work, the circular surface area formula suggests a diameter 20 inches provides roughly 314.2 square inches, thereby proving we're correct in making this choice. Here's another real world application of the circular surface area formula. Consider two circles with different diameters overlapping one another. The exterior circle has a diameter of 6 inches. The interior circle has a diameter of 3.5 inches. Let's say we wish to find the surface area of the donut-shaped, ring-like 
annular surface area around the perimeter. One way to visualize this is to think about cutting out the smaller circle from the larger circle. What's left over? The ring-like shape. An easy way of determining the ring area is to find the surface area of both circles and then subtract the surface area of the smaller interior from the larger exterior. Area of the ring is area outer minus area inner. An application of the circular surface area formula suggests the larger exterior circle has a surface area of roughly 28.3 square inches. Similarly, another application of the circular surface area formula suggests the smaller interior circle has a surface area of roughly 9.6 square inches. Substituting these values into the ring area formula, outer minus inner, suggests the ring-like area has a surface area of roughly 18.7 square inches. Alright, let's see if you're tracking with these types of problems by way of these two illustrated examples. Problem 1, given the previous array of available diameters, 2.5, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 16, 20, 25, 32, 40, 50, and 63, see if you can determine the diameter necessary to provide a minimum surface area of 100 square inches. Problem 2, determine the surface area of a ring-like shape formed by the larger exterior circle with a diameter of 8 inches and a smaller interior circle with a diameter of 4 inches. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. For problem 1, an algebraic manipulation of the circular surface area formula solving for unknown diameter demonstrates an 11.3 inch diameter would provide the required 100 square inches. Given the manufacturer doesn't have a cylinder of this exact dimensions, we're going to pick the closest one commercially available, in this case a 12. As it means a check in our work, an application of the circular surface area formula suggests a 12 inch diameter circle provides roughly 113.1 square inches, proving it is indeed the right tool for the job. For problem 2, an application of the circular surface area formula suggests the larger exterior circle has a surface area of roughly 50.3 square inches. Similarly, Another application of the circular surface area formula suggests the smaller interior circle has a surface area of roughly 12.6 square inches. Substituting these values into the ring area formula, outer minus inner, suggests the ring-like area has a surface area of roughly 37.7 square inches. Alright, now that we've got a solid hold on the circular surface area formula and applications, let's put on our 3D glasses and learn to calculate cylindrical volume. A cylinder is a circle expressed at a certain height. Volume is expressed in units of cubic inches. Sometimes cubic inches is written as CI by the morbidly lazy. The volume of a cylinder is circular area times height. If you want to calculate this all in one go, you could also write this formula as volume equals power 4 times diameter squared times height. However, I don't recommend you do this. Oftentimes it's easier to first calculate area, then calculate volume as area times height. Make sure you're using the saved results in your calculator not the approximation. Since this concept is pretty easy, let's go right to the illustrated examples. Consider our first set of illustrated examples at the beginning of this lecture. Let's see if we can determine cylindrical volume in each of cubic inches for these same examples given known height values. If you got the previous answer stored in your calculator memory, feel free to reuse these answers and save yourself some time. Circle 1 has a diameter of 5 inches and a height of 20 inches. Circle 2 has a diameter of 2.5 inches and a height of 12 inches. Circle 3 has a radius of 6 inches, which we all know is a diameter of 12 inches. It's got a height of 2 feet. Note the emphatic pronunciation, 2 feet. And finally, circle 4, the 55-gallon barrel. It's got a diameter of 22.5 inches and a height of 33.5 inches. Again, see if you can solve for cylindrical volume in units of cubic inches by multiplying circular area times height. I should note, for this set of example problems, U.S. customary units like inches, square inches, and cubic inches do not use engineering prefixes and must be expressed in their awkward entirety. By all means, pause the lecture, try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. An application of the cylindrical volume formula, area times height, demonstrates cylinder 1 has a volume of roughly 392.7 cubic inches. Similarly, another application of the cylindrical volume formula demonstrates cylinder 2 has a volume of roughly 58.9 cubic inches. Cylinder 3 has a height of 2 feet, which is equivalent to 24 inches. An application of the cylindrical volume formula demonstrates cylinder 3 has a volume of roughly 2,714.3 cubic inches. Those of you using the scientific calculator making use of engineering format may see this answer expressed as roughly 
2.7143 times 10 to the third and rush to the incorrect conclusion that this is a volume of roughly 2.7 kilo cubic inches. Again, I must remind you that U.S. customer units do not use engineering prefixes and must be expressed in their awkward entirety. This is quite literally a volume of 2,714.3 cubic inches and cannot be expressed in more expedient fashion. I don't like this any more than you, but you got to deal with it. Lastly, a final application of the cylindrical volume formula demonstrates cylinder 4, the 55-gallon drum, has a volume of roughly 13,319.9 cubic inches. Again, U.S. customary units do not use engineering prefixes and must be expressed in their awkward entirety. All right, that wasn't too hard, was it? Let's try a couple further applications of the cylindrical volume formula. Consider cylinder 1 and cylinder 3 from our previous examples. If you recall, cylinder 1 has a diameter of 5 inches and a height of 20 inches, whereas cylinder 3 has got a diameter of 12 inches and a height of 24 inches. Let's say we take cylinder 1 and we fill it to the brim with 392.7 cubic inches of the delicious Mexican cinnamon rice beverage, or chata. Cylinder 3 is empty. My question to you is this, what would happen if I empty the entire contents of cylinder 1 into presently empty cylinder 3? What happens? Does it fill entirely? Does it overflow? Or is cylinder 3 only partially filled? You'll note cylinder 3 is considerably larger than cylinder 1, so it stands to conjecture it will only be partially filled. Think about what I'm asking here. Given liquids conform to the shape of their container, what's the height of this cylinder? with a known volume and a known area. After all, it's spreading out over the known area of cylinder 3. Given volume equals area times height, one would solve for unknown height in terms of known area and volume by isolating unknown height on one side of the equation using the following steps. Divide both sides by A. A cancels out and we're left with height equals volume divided by area. Substituting in the known volume of 397.2 cubic inches, and the known area of cylinder 3 of 113.1 square inches into the algebraic manipulation demonstrates this same quantity of horchata only rises to a height of 3.4 inches given it's spread over a much larger surface area. Makes sense, right? It's the same volume of liquid and it doesn't fill a larger container nearly as much. Here's another application of cylindrical volume formula. Consider an empty cylinder with a diameter of 6 inches and height of 16 inches. Consider another smaller cylinder. This one, however, composed of solid steel with a diameter of 3.5 inches and also a height of 16 inches. Take the smaller solid steel cylinder and put it inside the larger empty cylinder. What's the volume of the remaining tube-like space? This is kind of like the 3D version of the ring area problem and uses similar techniques to solve, of which there are two methods. First, one determines the volume of the larger exterior cylinder. Then, one determines the volume of the smaller interior cylinder. To determine the volume of the remaining tube-like space, one would subtract the volume of the interior from the exterior. Volume of the tube equals exterior minus interior. If you don't like that technique, here's another way of doing it. Think back to the earlier illustrated example that examined the area of the ring-like shape formed by the overlapping a larger circle and a smaller interior circle. The area of the ring was the area of the outer minus the area of the inner. What if we simply took the area of the ring and multiplied it by height? I've got a reasonable degree of confidence this would also yield the volume of the remaining tube-like space. Let's see if both methods work. An application of the circular surface area formula suggests the larger exterior cylinder has a circular surface area of roughly 28.3 square inches. An application of the cylindrical volume formula suggests the larger exterior cylinder has a volume of roughly 452.4 cubic inches. Similarly, an application of the circular surface area formula suggests the smaller interior cylinder has a surface area of roughly 9.6 square inches. An application of the cylindrical volume formula suggests the interior cylinder has a volume of roughly 153.9 cubic inches. The volume of the tube is the exterior minus the interior. Substituting our calculated values demonstrates the volume of the remaining tube-like space is approximately 298.5 cubic inches. Let's check our work using the second formula, where the volume of the tube-like space is the area of the ring times the height. Substituting the previously calculated area values into the ring area formula, outer minus inner, suggests the ring-like area has a surface area of roughly 18.7 square inches. The volume of the tube 
is the area of the ring times height. Substituting the calculated values demonstrates the volume of the remaining tube-like space is 298.5 cubic inches. Exactly the same value we calculated earlier, albeit using a different method. I've got a reasonable degree of confidence we're correct. Before we move on to unit conversions common to fluid power applications, let me make something perfectly clear. The previous example featuring ring-like surface area and tubular volume isn't a frivolous party trick for math nerds. As we'll learn in later lectures, the principal linear actuator in hydraulic and pneumatic systems, the cylinder, is cylindrical in shape, and a thorough understanding of circular area and cylindrical volume is an absolute necessity towards understanding their behavior and performance characteristics. In keeping with the theme of this lecture, consider how the act of extending or retracting a cylinder changes the effective area or volume exposed to pressurized fluid. When a cylinder extends, pressurized fluid acts on the full circular area and fills the completely cylindrical volume of the cap end. This should be pretty obvious, even to those with only a passing familiarity with fluid power systems. What may not be so obvious is that when a cylinder retracts, the solid rod retracts into the cylinder barrel, taking up space and volume such that pressurized fluid does not act on a full circle, but rather a ring-like area. Additionally, this solid steel rod occupies volume, such that the rod end volume is not a full cylinder, but rather a tube-like space. Get a feel for this with this cartoonish animation. When extending, fluid must fill a fully cylindrical cap and volume, and pressurized fluid acts on a fully circular area. However, when retracting, fluid fills a smaller tubular rod end volume and pressurized fluid acts on a smaller ring-like annular rod end area. Take note of the terminology I'm using since it will be employed for the remainder of this lecture series. Cap end, rod end. The fully cylindrical side used to extend the cylinder is called the cap or the blind end whereas the tubular side used to retract the cylinder is called the rod end, not the rod, the rod end or annular end. In this spirit, try this example problem on for size. Consider a cylinder with a cap diameter of 8 inches and a travel length or height of 22 inches. When fully extended, we're dealing with ordinary circular area and ordinary cylindrical volume. However, when the cylinder retracts, it pulls a 4-inch diameter solid steel rod into the same volume. The solid steel removes effective area and volume. At full retraction, we're dealing with a ring-like area and a tubular volume. My question to you is this. What is the area and volume of the cap end at full extension? Similarly, what's the area of the ring-like rod end and the tubular volume of the rod end at full retraction? By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. An application of the circular surface area formula suggests the fully circular cap end area has an area of roughly 50.3 square inches. An application of the cylindrical volume formula demonstrates the fully cylindrical cap end has a volume of roughly 1,105.8 cubic inches. An application of the circular surface area formula demonstrates the smaller rod effectively this is the inner circle, has an area of roughly 12.6 square inches. The area of the annular ring-like rod end is the area of the cap minus the area of the rod. Substituting our calculated values demonstrates the ring-like rod end has an area of roughly 37.7 square inches. Lastly, the volume of the tube-like rod end is the area of the annular ring-like rod end times the height. Substituting our calculated values demonstrates the tube-like rod end has a volume of roughly 829.4 cubic inches. All right, hopefully that went well. All right, save those answers and try this bonus problem on for size, which might be a bridge too far. Let's consider two identical cylinders with the dimensions previously calculated hooked in a series fashion, where the outflow of one cylinder's rod end is the inflow of the other. We'll examine the details of series and parallel arrangements of fluid power actuators in later lectures. However, as a preview, if the downstream cylinder extends, the oil trapped in the rod end of the downstream cylinder is routed directly into the cap end of the upstream cylinder. My question to you is this. 
how far will the upstream cylinder extend if fluid from the downstream cylinder's rod end enters the upstream cylinder's cap end? Think about what I'm asking. A smaller volume of fluid enters a larger volume space. Will it fill it? Absolutely not. With a known quantity of fluid, 829.4 cubic inches, trapped in the upstream cylinder's rod end, entering the downstream cylinder's cap end with a known area, in this case 50.3 square inches. How much will this fill the downstream cylinder's cap end, i.e. what's the height? As previously, given volume equals area over height, one could algebraically rearrange this formula to solve for unknown height, where height equals volume divided by area. Substituting in the known volume of 829.4 cubic inches, a known area of 50.3 square inches into the algebraic manipulation demonstrates the downstream cylinder extends only 16.5 inches, or roughly 75% of the full 22-inch travel length. It makes sense, right? This quantity of fluid trapped in the smaller tubular rod end in the upstream cylinder only partially fills the larger fully cylindrical cap end of the downstream cylinder. We'll examine additional examples of series and parallel connections of fluid power actuators in later lectures. Now that we've got a good understanding of the circular area and cylindrical volume formulas, let's quickly discuss unit conversions common in fluid power systems. An archaic unit commonly employed in hydraulics is the gallon, where one gallon is equivalent to 231 cubic inches. I don't know why, so don't ask me. You recall in the unit conversion lecture available at the Big Bad Tech channel, we discussed a simple method for unit conversion whereby the quantity in question is multiplied by one, a range that the units we don't want cancel out and the units we do want remain. Consider a 55 gallon drum with a diameter of 22.5 inches and a height of 33.5 inches. As we previously demonstrated, the drum has a volume of roughly 13,319.9 cubic inches. Can one really fit 55 gallons of toxic waste into this drum? Convert 55 gallons to cubic inches. 55 gallons times 231 cubic inches over one gallon, units of gallons cancel out. 55 gallons is roughly equivalent to 12,705 cubic inches. Indeed we can, with plenty of room to spare. Let's try this in reverse. How many gallons can you actually fit in here? Convert 13,319.9 cubic inches to gallons. 13,319.9 cubic inches times one gallon over 231 cubic inches. Units of cubic inches cancel out, which demonstrates this is roughly equivalent to 57.7 gallons. All right, your turn. Consider a cylinder with a diameter of 9 inches and a height of 14 inches. Determine the volume in units of cubic inches and convert cubic inches to gallons. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should obtain the following results. The cylinder has an area of roughly 63.6 .6 square inches and a volume of roughly 890.6 cubic inches. A unit conversion demonstrates 89.6 cubic inches is roughly equivalent to 3.9 gallons. Bonus round! Let's say I fill the cylinder up with 3.9 gallons of liquid and I take a smaller solid steel cylinder and drop it inside it. How much liquid spills out? How much liquid remains? Let's say the solid steel cylinder has a diameter of 3.25 inches and a height of 14 inches. Again, how much liquid spills out, how much liquid remains. Express your answer in units of gallons. Again, note gallons do not use engineering prefixes and any quantity less than one gallon must be expressed as a fractional or decimal equivalent. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. The solid steel cylinder has an area of roughly 8.3 square inches and a volume of roughly 116.7 cubic inches. This means 116.1 cubic inches of the original 890.6 cubic inches spills out the floor and 890 minus 116 or roughly 774.5 cubic inches remains. All we got to do is convert these values to gallons. A unit conversion demonstrates 116.1 cubic inches is roughly equivalent to 0.5 gallons. Another unit conversion demonstrates 774.5 cubic inches is roughly equivalent to 3.5 gallons. There you have it circular area, cylindrical volume, and unit conversion. I do believe we've accomplished what we set out to do and could bring this lecture to a close. Just kidding. One more set of examples before I cut you loose. Lest you think all circular area and cylindrical volume calculations feature archaic units of inches, 
Let's do a couple quick calculations featuring metric units. Really nothing changes as long as you remain consistent. As we demonstrated with US customer units, given diameter in inches, one expresses area in square inches and volume in cubic inches. Metric units are no different. Given diameter in centimeters, area is expressed in square centimeters and volume in cubic centimeters. Similarly given diameter in meter, area is expressed in square meter and volume in cubic meters and so on. I should also mention the liter is a unit of volume, or a liter is a cube with dimensions of 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, or 0.1 meters by 0.1 meters by 0.1 meters. Conversion is relatively easy using the metric system where one cubic meter is equivalent to a thousand liters. Let's try a couple quick metric examples and call it a day. Consider an industrial wind turbine generator with a 116 meter rotor diameter. Solve for area in units of meter squared. Too easy. Area is pi over 4 times diameter squared. Substituting given diameter into the circular surface area equation suggests this wind turbine rotor has a surface area of roughly 10,568.3 square meters. This is sometimes called the rotor swept area or RSA and it's a measure of how much wind this turbine can capture. Turbines with longer blades have larger diameters and thus larger areas and are consequently exposed to more wind. Case in point, consider another turbine However, this one is designed for low wind areas. Each blade is 8 meters longer, resulting in an increased rotor diameter of 132 meters. How does this relatively small increase in blade length affect rotor swept area? Substituting the given diameter into the circular surface area equation suggests this new larger wind turbine rotor has a surface area of roughly 13,684.8 square meters. A relatively small 8 meter extension of each blade has resulted in more than 3,000 square meters of additional RSA. Alright, that's that. In conclusion, this lecture introduced circular area and cylindrical volume calculations and explored how these calculations are commonly employed in fluid power systems. Additionally, we learned how to convert cubic inches to gallons and vice versa. Lastly, we learned how to perform area calculations using metric units. Thank you very much for your attention and interest. We'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.